So we're beginning a new conversation this month. We're going to dive into a, a different topic. And I am so excited about how our focus on mind shift has really brought liberation to so many people and how many of you have taken time to send me notes, to send me DMs or comments and let me know how the frameworks and mind shift have been liberating and life changing for you. And it's exciting just to, um, to watch God do deep things in people's lives when we let him change our minds. But today we're moving in a different direction. Today we're going to have the talk. You know, the talk, the talk that that parents always dread having. The talk that, you know, one day your kids are going to be old enough, and if you wait too long, they've already had to talk with someone else. So you feel obligated to have the talk. And, and today we're going to work as if you never had the talk. No, not, not the sex talk. I know that's the one that you're thinking. <laughs> that talk's hard enough, and most of us avoid it anyway. Now, I want to talk to you about the wealth talk, the money talk. Isn't it odd that we're told you need to have the sex talk with your kid? Well, we're never told you need to have the money talk with your kid. We just let someone else teach our children how to think about money. Or we hope somehow we pick it through osmosis, which is unfortunately the way we probably get the sex talk too. We get a hodgepodge of thinking, a mixed bag of good thinking and bad thinking that we somehow integrate into our lives unconsciously. But today I want to talk to you about a subject that is probably the most uncomfortable subject for me to talk about, money. Well, I would probably be more uncomfortable talking about sex, but, but it's right there. They're right there, right next to each other. But what's odd to me, though, is that that if I were to be perfectly honest and candid, I actually love thinking about wealth. I love thinking about what the scriptures teach about this arena of life and, and a great deal of my time and energy in what I do behind the scenes is working with people who have amassed incredible wealth and having conversations about how do we relate to money. And, and so I want to talk to you today and and I'm looking at a room, especially here, of people who actually are very good with their money. So I don't want to assume that I know things you don't know. I'm sure that you have so much insight and deeper understanding. But I'm going to just talk for a few minutes as if none of us know. And we're going to build a biblical view of wealth. And in, in it, we will talk about money, and in it, we will talk about generosity, and in it, we'll talk about other things. But, but really, I just want to give a, a basic overview of how the scriptures expect that we actually think about wealth. Because one of the challenging things sometimes is when you have a principle, you can actually extract that principle. But when you have a worldview, you can actually miss the worldview. Because when there's a principle, there's a, a teaching, a truth, that you're told that this is what's true. When there's a worldview, there are assumptions. And, and the framework is, of course you believe this. It's like there really is no place in the Bible that says you are a human. It doesn't have to repeat that over and over again. That's a basic framework. It starts with Adam and Eve, and that's the story of us. But no one has probably ever sat down with you. And in fact, you didn't have that talk when you were eight. I know you like unicorns, but you are human. No! Right? I know you want to be a giraffe, but you are a human. Most of us aren't traumatized by that conversation. There are basic assumptions made about us. And the scriptures actually make basic assumptions about wealth. And I don't know how to have this talk with you without opening up some of my own private life, which makes me very uncomfortable. But I want to begin here. You are created to produce wealth. And it's not just an outside idea, it's, it's a biblical idea. I, I want you to hear this beautiful phrase in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18. And, and if you've never 
Mark that. I, I think you should mark it. It says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Now, now the basic context is, is as Moses is working to form this new nation, this people, they're creating a, a cultural identity. And, and he's saying, hey, I want you to remember that it's actually God who gives you the ability to create wealth. And, and so he's giving us almost two sides of a very important truth. You should never forget that whatever capacity you have, whatever talent you have, whatever gifting you have, whatever intelligence you have, whatever nuanced ability to create wealth you might have, that that was actually given to you by God. And if God gives you that ability, he expects you to use it. And so the ability to create wealth is actually something gave, God gave to you so that you could be productive with your life. Now, what I don't want you to hear me say is that everyone's supposed to be rich. I wish that were true. But I, I think in the same way that, that no two human beings are the same, no two of us are designed the same way when, even when it comes to wealth. Now, there's some of you who have extraordinary capacity to create wealth, and it's ridiculously unfair. And the rest of us will just hope you were just lucky. But the truth is, you're just designed differently. Just like some people are faster than you, and some people are stronger than you, and some people are smarter than you. Okay, maybe not you, but me. See, I have to accept in my life that there are people who are faster than me, and stronger than me, and smarter than me, and are more talented than me. And, and there are things in my life I've loved. I, I wanted to be a musician, but I'm just not that good. I wanted to be a painter, but I'm just not any good. There's so many things I've wanted to be, and the reality is I wasn't structured or given that unique talent in my life. And, but it doesn't mean there's certain things I cannot do. Just because I am not an Olympic athlete doesn't mean I can't be athletic. Just because I, I'm not a genius doesn't mean I can't enjoy playing chess. It just means the spectrum is different. And what I do know is God's designed you with the ability to create. And in that creative process is the ability to create wealth. Now, the reason this is so important for me is I really struggled with this as a spiritual expression of my life. When I came to faith, when I was around 20 years old, I instantly became a monastic. Now, for those of you who don't know what a monastic is. Basically, I became a person who committed myself to disconnect from all material things. And I, everything I owned, you could put in a grocery bag. That's all I had in the whole world. And because of my conviction, I always just made just enough money to pay the bills. And sometimes not enough money to pay the bills. There were even times in my life, at that season of my life, I would walk down the street hoping I could find loose change because I didn't know how to pay the bills. Because I was trying to live this life that was disconnected from any love or connection or affection or need for money. And, and that's that season when Kim met me. And some of it was a reaction to my own family. So when Kim and I met, and she was an orphan, and she lived in a foster home, and she had grown up in poverty, we just were a perfect match. She never had anything, and I was against having anything. And so when we were first married, I did not buy a bed because I told her a bed was a luxury. I was a jerk. <laughs> but I was trying to apply a highly idealistic view of life. So you have to understand, I'm actually talking to you as a person where my story began with a deep sense of suspicion toward anyone who created wealth, anyone who had wealth, anyone who aspired to ever be financially successful. I knew there was something wrong with them. And I began to equate wealth with evil and poverty with good, which made it easy for me to be good. 
All I had to do was be poor. And I was morally superior to you. And then the, there's this. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. He says it as if it's the same as your ability to breathe. Imagine if you woke up and you didn't have the ability to breathe. It would be, oh, life-threatening. Because there are things that God designed you for that are just natural abilities. Your ability to breathe. Your ability to digest food and extract from that food the nutrition that you need to thrive. Those are things that God gave you that you don't even think about. There are so many inherent natural abilities that God has given every human being that we just assume well, that's just what it means to be human. But here it says God gave you the ability to produce wealth. And until you embrace that, you will not live up to your full potential or capacity or calling. Now, I don't know how much wealth you're created to produce, but I do know this. You are actually designed for work. It was always amazing to me when I would read and, and look at the lives of Karl Marx and others, and, and I realized that there was almost like this view that work was the enemy, that work was evil, that work was a punishment, and even a misunderstanding of the early chapters of Genesis when God tells Adam and Eve, because of their separation from God, that work would now become a burden. Work is not a curse. Work is actually a gift. Work is a privilege. Work is an opportunity. We are designed for work because we're designed to create. It's when work becomes our source of meaning and identity and value that it becomes a curse to us. Because your job will never give you meaning. You have to give meaning to your job. But remember, remember, it is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Do you remember that? Do you know that whatever you produce, it was a gift? Now, here's the nuance. This does not say God is going to make you rich. This does not say that God is going to make you wealthy. What he actually says is he's giving you inherent abilities to create, and that process is your responsibility. It's not magic. It's work. But I love the fact that I'm, I'm created to produce wealth. I, I do remember the day. Kim and I had been married probably at least 10 years. And I, I think for the first 10 years, I never made more than $16,000 a year. Total salary. Averaged a little under 9,000 for most of those 10 years. And we moved to LA with nothing. And Patty, our, our daughter in the Lord, Aaron was three, Mariah was 30 days old. You know, Kim had just had a baby. And we didn't have jobs, we didn't have work. And I'm working myself to death, traveling, doing everything I can just to pay the bills to live in LA, it's crazy. We moved here without any income, without any job. Well, anyone who actually cared about us financially. And I came home one day, and some of it was desperation and prayer and having conversations with God going, how is this going to play out? And in one of those moments, I had this, I don't know, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's just, I just felt this epiphany. And I went home and I told Kim, I said, I think God has given me permission to create wealth. I said, exactly like that. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, I think God gave me permission to create wealth. And she goes, you know how to create wealth? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've, I've always known how. I've just always been against it. She goes, well, I would encourage you <laughs> to be for it. And, and I was married to someone who was willing to live with nothing and accepted me if I was only capable of creating nothing. That's pretty rare. But I had never taken on the responsibility of who God had created me to be. See, it wasn't wrong for me to be living at that level if that was the level at which I was created to create. 
But the fact that I actually had the capacity to create more, to create wealth, to create jobs for people, to create futures for people, to create opportunities for people, to create places of hope and joy and meaning for their lives. But I wasn't willing to do that because I didn't want to take on that kind of responsibility because I, I, I had this adversarial relationship to wealth. I, I was one of those people that misquoted the Bible because one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible is that money is evil. But in 1 Timothy 6.10, he doesn't say that money is the root of evil. He says it's the love of money that's the root of evil. And so a lot of us go, I don't know how to not love money, so I'll just stop making money. Change your heart and make a lot of money. You're created to produce wealth. You're designed to be generative, to create, to generate. Because without generating, you cannot be generous. And I'm concerned because I think we live in a time where our mental frameworks, our, our cultural perspective is that someone should take care of us. And the government should provide everything for us, or, some, or the church should provide everything for us, or, this, or some other institutions should provide everything for us. And this mindset is so counter to the way God designed you. Because as long as you expect someone else to provide for you, you are not stepping into your creative potential. I am so clear that the Bible says that we steal because we do not know we can create. But I also want you to see that our wealth aligns us. So I, first of all, I want you to know, you are created to create wealth. I don't know how much, but stop acting like you need someone to create for you. You can create. And press the limit. See how much you can create. Have fun. But then I want you to realize that your wealth, it, it aligns you. In, in Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10, it says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Worldview. You're going to have wealth you need to honor God with. That's the assumption. Most of us don't even know that, but he's actually working from the assumption. Honor God with your wealth. Most of us go, what wealth? Or maybe we're not honoring God if we're living beneath our capacity and potential. Honor God with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. That's, that's where the, the, the whole framework of tithe comes from, 10%. You bring that 10% and you bring it to God. And, and I started just, I wanted to remind myself. So I went back to the scriptures and go, where is this framework of 10% come from? Where does God tell us to give 10%? I have to tell you, I got shocked. You know how you knew, but then you forget? Then you have to re-know? It wasn't that God told us or told someone that they needed to give 10%. It was someone who told God, I will give you 10%. In Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22, it says this. Then Jacob, when he was at Bethel, using a rock or a stone as his pillow and having a connection between heaven and earth. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey that I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. It's Jacob saying to God, will you really be my God? Will you really be with me? Is this what you're offering me? Is, is this what this moment has awakened me to that you are the connection between eternity and time. That there's a separation between heaven and earth for you, that you are here with me. If you will be God with me and watch over me on my journey, if you, God, help me have food to eat and clothes to wear, then my house will be your house. You will be my God. And God, I just want you to know, 
that if everything you give me, there's the, there's the framework, everything you give me, I will give you a tenth. Our wealth aligns us. It allows us to know who or what is our priority. I could have gone to other verses where God tells you to give 10%. I just think that that's the weaker version of faith. See, I, I don't want to convince you that God expects you to give 10% of your income to honor him with your first fruit. I want to invite you to step into a relationship with God that's so compelling and so overwhelming that you say, God, if you will be with me on this journey, nothing could stop me from giving the first tenth of everything I received to you just to realign my heart and let you know that you are my singular first priority in life. Your heart directs your wealth. And your wealth reveals your heart. I went back just to see what some of the more Hebraic views of tithing, and I just grabbed this one line. Tithing was seen as performing a mitzvah, done in joyful obedience to God. Giving tithe would open oneself to receive of divine blessing. It doesn't buy God's blessing. Let me be so clear. Nothing you ever give to God will buy anything from God because God is not for sale. You cannot give to God to receive some kind of benefit from God because God will not be manipulated or coerced. What tithing does is it doesn't move God, it moves us. What what giving that first tenth to God does is it aligns your heart so that you are positioned to receive everything God has for you. See, God is always generous. It's not you have to try to figure out how to get God to be generous. God is always generous. That's why in the Bible it says that God reigns on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you want God to reign on you, you can be unrighteous. You don't have to be good for God to be good. God is always good. But when you're not aligned with God, all of his goodness falls on hardened ground and never seeps into the soil of your soul. You will convince yourself everything you have you did on your own. Now, I want my heart to be aligned with God's generosity. And this is a tricky thing, and I I hesitate saying this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say this. Kim and I, we tithe. And we we give way beyond 10%. And and I can tell you, and I'm just going to say this, and I may regret saying this, but this year, Kim and I have tithed six figures to Mosaic. When people talk about, okay, you don't don't have to clap. It it probably should have been more. (laughs) No, when people talk about pastors using churches to get rich, I think people need to look in the mirror. Because whenever you accuse someone else of doing good things, being motivated by greed, it's just because greed is your motivation for every good thing you do. And I just want to be so clear. You are not my best financial strategy. (laughs) And and I'm just going to say this straight up. If I had not been a pastor, I would be a billionaire. I chose to make less to serve you. And I think this is important because people always want to act like religion is just some source of economic coercion or manipulation. When you value people above things, it changes the way you make choices in life. But I also knew that you couldn't afford us. And so we had to find a way to create wealth. 
And I always had to do it secretly so no one would think, well, what's a pastor doing making money? Because I can. Because I'm good at it. Because I was given by God the ability to produce wealth. And because I have people I love that are dramatically impacted by that as well. And it's not really about how much you can gain for yourself. It's how many people's lives you can radically alter through your own creative energy and commitment to generosity. Which, by the way, is the next thing I want you to see. When the scriptures talk about wealth, they're just so clear. God gives you the capacity to create wealth. When you're aligned with God, you give that first tenth to God. This is, tithing is not generosity. Tithing is simply gratitude. Saying, God, I recognize everything I have is from you. But then God wants you to be generous. And I love this phrase, and this is the one I want to use. You need to always leave the edges. You need to learn how to be generous. In Leviticus 22, 23 verses 22, it says this. When you reap the harvest of your land... Do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And then Leviticus 19, verses 9 through 11, it says this. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. And I think it's interesting, the very next verse, even though it's not connected in the theme, says this, I am the Lord your God, do not steal. Yeah, it struck me too. This is the cultural framework that God gave the people of Israel. This is your land. It's your harvest. These are your crops. Those are your grapes. That's your wheat. There's no ambiguity. That's your stuff. Leave the edges for the poor. Don't go back a second time extricating, extracting everything you can. Don't be so greedy in your wealth that you only consume and consume and consume. And it's interesting when you look at the history of the Israelites, they were asked to leave a tenth of everything for the poor. Well, how do you apply that when, how many of you own vineyards? If you do, let me know. And <laughs> how many of you own wheat fields? Most of us don't own things where we have to then leave things in the field, but you do have corners and edges in your life. People always ask me, well, you know, how much is it okay to have? Or, you know, when, when, when do you buy too many things? Or, you know... I, I have friends I just don't even, I can't even comprehend, to be honest with you, some of them. I'm like, they have so many houses, I've never seen them all. I don't know if they've seen them all, and, and to be honest with you. And, you know, I, you have people have so many cars, or they have so many things, and you think, how, how much is, is enough? And, and we always want to measure people by how much they have, when we should measure people by how much they give. And so this is what I know. No matter how much wealth you have, you should never use all of your wealth for yourself. And this is a principle Kim and I applied when we were making 12,000 a year, 20,000 a year. This is a principle we established in our life in the beginning. No matter how much we make, we always leave some to give. And it didn't feel like we had anything to give. But there were ways. When we didn't have as much wealth, we had, we had people live with us 20 out of the first 21 years of our marriage for free. They were not renters. They lived with us for free. And if any of them ever gave any money, it's because they decided to, not because we ever asked them. It was a part of the way we could open up the edges of our field. We didn't have a lot, but what we had, we shared. It's why Kim always cooks for 20 when there's only two of us. She's always expecting people. And, and it is actually why whenever we cook for people, we always cook for more than the people coming so that people can take food home. It's why during the pandemic, when 
Aaron bought me a smoker. I started smoking every Friday, and I would make enough food for 40 to 50 people. And they would come by on Friday and pick up the meals to take to their families for those 18 months of quarantine. Because there's just some way that you could always find a way to leave the edges of your field open. One of my favorite things in the world to do is I love to tip. I'm, you know, I was watching a clip, someone asking Dave Ramsey, do you have to tip people here and there? I'm like, that's just so wrong. The moment you're asking, do I have to tip this person or tip this person or do I have to tip in this situation? Your problem is that your tipping isn't going to change you because you're not tipping out of a heart of generosity and abundance. And I... I made a commitment in my life because I remember one time Kim and I were walking and there was these uh, two or three construction workers, all immigrants, all Latin American. And they were working construction. It was clearly their break. And they had these little paper bags and they had sandwiches with white bread. I, I noted that. And they were eating the sandwiches with white bread and they had the little thermos. And I remember walking and I said to Kim, you know how people say there by the grace, but by the grace of God go I? I said, that's not true for me. I said, honey, that was me. See, I was the immigrant working construction, eating my lunch out of a paper bag with a sandwich made with white bread. I don't know why the white bread matters, but it does. <laughs> that was me. That wasn't me in an alternative life. That was me in this life. That was me going to work every day, working construction, wondering if this is what I was going to do every single day for the rest of my life. But at least I had work. That, that was me so humiliated because I didn't even have a car, so they had to pick me up at our apartment so I could have a ride to go to work and a ride to come back. See, that, that was me. And I'm here today because there were people who did not harvest their edges. I'm here today because there are people who left the edges for me. And they served and they helped and they were generous. And I remember the day when I had come to faith and my mom was saying, are you going back to college? And I said, no, I'm not going to go back. I can't really afford it anyway. And I was paying my own way and I'm just... And a man came up to me on my birthday and said, happy birthday, Irwin. And when he shook my hand, he handed me a check. And it was a check for my college tuition. The man didn't know me. He didn't owe me anything. But I'm here because of him. See, I remember when Kim and I were first married and we were struggling to get by. And, and somebody called us and said, we, we just feel like we're supposed to... Um, help you buy a car. And you, well, they, they put the money down for the down payment for a car. I remember that. I remember getting that Buick Skyhawk. <laughs> and then we were there looking at this Buick that we could not afford. It was the cheapest car they made. And the salesman, he said, well, how much money do you make? I said, I don't make any. And he goes, well, how can you afford this car? I said, no idea. And he goes, well, how are you going to put money down? I said, I'm not sure. I just know that God always shows up for me. And then I get that call, and that person gives us the exact amount of money for the down payment. I go in the next day to that place, and I give the guy the down payment for the car, and he calls me in my dorm room and says, I need to talk to you. I'd been in prison for arson because I lost my job as a draftsman. I was angry. I'm working as a car salesman. I have no reason to live. And on Christmas Eve, I got to go to the car salesman's house and lead him to Jesus because someone else left the edges of their field open for me and left the edges of the field open for someone else. And I want you to realize that this is the way God's kingdom expands. And, you know, so I think it was Friday night, Kim's going to a little birthday party, and she's going to BJ's Pizza, which I just would not choose to go to myself. But, but that's where the two birthday kids wanted to go, and so we went there. And, and the man serving us is probably 40 years old. And I'm thinking to myself, this man is at, 
almost 40 and he's working at BJ's and I just know this is not how he expected his life to turn out. It was just so fun for me to tip him an insane amount. It probably covered his whole night's work. And he didn't even know what to say. He just found me before we left. He's like, thank you. And I, I remember just grabbing the stranger's arm and I said, I just want to thank you for working so hard to making, for making our lives a little bit better. See, to me, there's just nothing more exciting, nothing more fun than not harvesting the edges of your field. I hope there's a day where I can tip $200,000 a year. I hope I can tip more than I've ever imagined making. Because I, I, I want fields not so that I can have a bigger field. I want fields so that people can eat the edges everywhere. And then just one last thing, because the music is playing. <laughs> it's always weird when you overstage your, your welcome. <laughs> but stay with me just another minute. I want to give you one last thought that I just need you to think about when you go home. That is it possible that you, you set the parameters of your own wealth? Wealth isn't how much you make. Wealth really is about how much you give. But I want you to listen to this in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, verses 6 to 8, and then verse 11. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I'm, I'm sitting here fighting back tears, having this inner narrative going, why would you cry talking about money? It's because I, I'm convinced money is what holds most people hostage. And I'm very convinced that for far too many people who believe in Jesus, their relationship to money is the anchor around their neck. Not understanding that God created you to produce wealth. That when you create wealth, you decide whether you're good or evil, not the wealth. That it's essential for more wealth to be in the hands of good people. We can complain all day long about how all the people with wealth are not good people. But that just makes us whiners. I would challenge you to take a different path. God, I want to press the limits of whatever capacity you've placed in me. I, I, I want God to harvest as large a field as you can entrust me with. And God, I promise you, I will never, never, never Take what's in the corners. I'll leave the edges. I'll live a life of insane generosity. But here's the, the principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This is not me saying this. I'm just reading to you what it says, and you decide if you will believe it in practice. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Is it possible that, that we keep saying, God, do more in my life, and God keeps saying, be more generous with your life? You establish the parameters. You can be limitless if you become limitless in your generosity. You can become limitless if you focus on serving people and making the world better and always creating so that other people's lives are impacted by the good you do. 
David, I think you were with us in that time. Was in Orlando when, was it the hurricane that hit? And what, was it like a Promise Keepers event or something? I have such a bad memory. And, and so I was supposed to speak and I don't know, 10, 20,000 people, something like that. But a hurricane came and interrupted my important talk. And we're there in this hotel and some of our friends are there who had never been in hurricanes, so they're outside experiencing the winds. We're trying to help them understand that's not always the best idea, but it was fun. And then there was a crisis. People were having to leave Tampa and were driving to central Florida and they couldn't didn't have places to stay and the hotel wouldn't let people stay in the lobby. And, and I remember going to the front desk and asking them how many open rooms do they have and are they going to make them available for the victims who are displaced? And they said, no, we can't against company policy. And, and I, I think at that season in our life, with Kim working and me working, I think our combined salary was around $35,000 a year. So we were, we were crushing. Like, man, we were you know, scaling our company, right? And, but I did have credit cards. And so I went to the front desk and I put all the credit cards I had and I paid for every single room in the hotel so that they would put families who were displaced in them. And um, not a single person who stayed in the room ever sent us a thank you note. Isn't that terrible? They never like sent me a gift, no Christmas cards, you're the guy. Oh, that's right, because they didn't know who it was. They just knew that these rooms were available for them now for their families and their kids. And I remember, you know, Kim and I would always have, we always had these great conversations. How, how are we going to pay for that? And I would, I'm not recommending this. I said, that's tomorrow's problem. Today, these people are needing a place to stay is today's problem. I have never gone broke being generous. Never. Not one time in my life. I've tried. See, I actually believe in this principle. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I'm going to live my life proving God true. I refuse to reap sparingly because I have sown sparingly. So I want to challenge you. Not, not for what it could do for Mosaic or what it could do for the world, but how it will change you. Because maybe what's actually the bottleneck of God unleashing in you the full capacity that you have is simply because you haven't learned to live your life with open hands. You, you set your parameters. You decide how abundant do you want to live? How generous do you want to experience life? And by the way, this is true outside of money. If you want to be loved, you need to love generously. If you want to have friends, you need to be a friend generously. If you want to be trusted, you need to trust generously. If you want to be forgiven, you need to forgive generously. Whatever you want in life, you need to give it generously. And when you give it generously, I'm telling you, it will return to you in abundance. And your life will feel limitless. Because the power is not in figuring out how to make more money. It's in deciding to do more good. Let me just close with these words from God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in the house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So today's invitation is very, very concrete. There are envelopes on your chair. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to grab an envelope right now and just grab the pen. 
This is not me going to, I'm not going to ask you to give money right now. I'm going to ask you to look in the mirror right now. I want you to just the best you can, because maybe you're not great at math, write down, don't write your name, just write down how much money you predict, you project you will have given away this year. You can go outside of Mosaic. It can be anywhere. It can be United Way. It can be Habitat for Humanity. They just can't be your cousin, Louie. Right. I just want you to take a moment and just write down, this is how much money I project. I have given away, and I will give away before the end of the year. Because this is a practical measure of how your heart is postured to receive from God. Not in comparison to anyone else's amount, but in comparison to your own personal faithfulness. Now, by the way, you may be listening and this talk is not for you in the most direct way. Because maybe you've never opened up your life to God. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus with your life the last place you should be giving is to the church, right? Because you don't believe. The church is a place where those of us who know Jesus give together to advance his message of love. And so if you're listening and you're not a follower of Jesus, this is what I would encourage you to do. Two things. One, be generous somewhere. Find an organization you trust and give there so that you can break the cycle of greed that holds all of humanity captive. But the second thing I would do is realize that God has already generously given himself for you. That's why Jesus came. God is a generous God. He sacrificed his life, asking you nothing in return except to receive his love. And if you're here and you've never opened up your life to Jesus, I would encourage you right now just to whisper a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. That's where it begins. With Jesus, I give you my life. Now behind me, I think we're going to put up the way you can give. You can give online at mosaic.org slash give. And I thought, hey, if you're not ready to give to Mosaic, you could actually give to Mosaic Global or Mosaic Educational Initiative. That money goes outside of the church. By the way, Mosaic Educational Initiative has 97 students they're sponsoring right now from around the world. It's beautiful. Come on. With Mosaic Global, we've built a school in Malawi. We're building homes for teachers. We're helping families who have been displaced due to, uh, I think it was a tsunami. And, um, and we're just doing so much good in the world. So find a place to start your giving. And we're going to do something we haven't done in 100 years. We're going to pass the bucket, and I want you to put the envelope in the bucket right now. It's kind of surreal to see you all dropping something into a bucket. I, I feel like we're back in the 1980s. It's kind of awesome. All right. Can't take that long. I know we're, we're out of practice, but the buckets can move faster. Okay. And by the way, that envelope is symbolic, but I hope that some of you will go beyond symbol to actual giving. And we'll make giving here to advance what Jesus is doing through Mosaic, a priority in your life. You establish your priorities by how you organize your money. It's as simple as that. Pastor David, I love you guys.